Probably the most incredible thing about nuclear power is the energy density. You know, like usually to power someone's life with coal, they need so much coal. But for nuclear power, just a teeny tiny bit of uranium. Gummy bears with the uranium is equivalent to an entire ton of coal. Yeah, 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 and that's because where uranium comes from, it's two neutron stars in binary orbit, and closer and closer until, pow, uranium all over the universe. Isn't that freaking cool? What did Eric do wrong? He let me speak when he could have been conveying even more valuable information. This has been Sarah with Tips for Nuke Bros. Today we are going to be talking to you about effective methods on how to communicate when we're talking about nuclear. My name is Matt and I joined Generation Atomic last year to take on the Building Bridges project. And I, now I know what that squeak is. <laughs> I was wondering. So I will be careful not to move too much around here. Yes, I, I joined Generation Tonic last year to take on the Building Bridges project. This is an initiative where we are recruiting and training a worldwide network of nuclear energy activists. So far, we've taken 100 people through this training, and we've been able to bring nuclear energy representation to over 20 different countries. Once they join us, they go through a training on nuclear communication. So we help them find ways that they can promote nuclear in their communities. And I'll let DJ introduce himself too. First off, I'd like to say I am super excited to be here. It's, it, it's, it's an honor. I, I have been watching these videos since very early on in my career. And uh, I, I'm just really happy to be able to actually like be the person up front talking in front of you. Like that's it's incredible. Um, as you all know, um, my name is DJ Leclerc. Uh, by day, I'm actually a nuclear safety specialist. Uh, but by nights, on my my own time, uh, I have been doing a lot of nuclear advocacy online, social media. That's where I know a lot of these faces here. It's incredible to see some of these faces. Since about 2017, I've been doing nuclear advocacy online, and uh, I started out really in the trenches of comment sections. I'm pretty sure I've been alongside some of you in, in uh, very interesting forums uh, that might not be pro-nuclear. And uh, I also started the Pragmatic Envi Environmentalist page uh, on Facebook. And then from there, I transitioned into doing the Rad Guy on TikTok, and it's shared across five different platforms, uh, TikTok, Twitter, uh, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. We're gonna discuss why nuclear communication or effective communication in nuclear is important. Um, we'll talk about two different methods of communication and three different rules that are required to take place in order for effective conversations to happen. Um, lastly, we'll finish up with an advocacy tool called Leclerc's Hill, which DJ himself has developed. Big topic today is how to have effective and product, er, productive conversations about nuclear energy. And I would say most of us here are familiar with all the great arguments to support nuclear, but having conversations about nuclear can sometimes be difficult. And there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, it's a vast and expansive topic. We've got transmission, distribution, storage, generation, all sorts of ways to go about it and lots of to address. There's confusing terminology. Um, there's even lots of misinformation to address. And nuclear in general has its fair share of that. We know that we've seen people hold on to long held beliefs that have been debunked long ago. And also when people hold on to these beliefs for a long time, it can be hard to get them to change their mind. Um, and then also with nuclear and energy in general, it's easy to get into the weeds. Uh, how do we know how we're gonna talk to our audience in an effective way? We probably know lots of facts and evidence, but how do we discuss that without losing the attention of our audience. Having the right approach is very important because if it's done right, we can see great results occur. And we've seen this happen throughout history. 
Um, the women's suffrage movement had to combat ideas that if women were given the right to vote, factories would go out of business due to all the increased worker restrictions. And also Martin Luther King led the civil rights movement and he's been highly regarded for his communication style, which included empathy and authority. And I would argue that the Thorium Energy Alliance and all of you that are sitting right here in these chairs have done tremendous work in moving the pro-nuclear opinion forward. Uh, we've seen great things happen in the last year, Japan restarting its nuclear fleet, uh, Diablo Canyon being extended. So lots of things going on and we thank you for that. As Matt mentioned, we have been moving the needle. We've actually been bringing people towards pro-nuclear side, a lot of that being part of your effort. I know that this was actually mentioned already today. I'd like to mention, you might hear some of the things that we're saying have already been said in some presentations before. Uh, we did not collaborate that, just to, just to let you know. Uh, we just came to those conclusions independently, and now we're sharing with you uh, basically the same thing because the conclusions are all the same. Majority of Americans they support nuclear power, majority of Americans. Like, that's phenomenal. Specifically, Democrats. The, the change in just the last few years has been remarkable. 60%? Like, I, I, I never knew that that was possible. So you might be asking yourself, uh, why, why then do we care about changing the way we're communicating? It seems to be working, right? Uh, we're, we're growing the pro-nuclear side of things. Why improve our communication? Well. I would argue we've, we've done some of the easy work, right? Uh, and we've built a, a wave towards the pro-nuclear side. But I'd say there are still, there is still a large holdout. There's still those voices on the anti-nuclear side that they can change that needle again. What would happen if we had something like a nuclear meltdown tomorrow? We still have a lot of work to really uh, maintain this wave of pro-nuclear people. Additionally, there's only a few of us. I could recognize a majority of the nuclear advocates. We all know each other. We're a very small crew, and we need to do communication effectively so that we're more efficient with our resources. We only have so many of us. We're pretty spread thin. So if we have effective communication, we should be able to bring more people over more efficiently. How can we communicate effectively? How many of you are this type of person at the party? You can talk about nuclear power pretty much everywhere you are. Like, I I'm that way. I I and it seems almost magical, right? Like, you'll just be talking normal everyday stuff, and then somehow the conversation goes to nuclear power. Like, by magic, really, it's you because you're, you're passionate about this, right? Sometimes those conversations can go very well. Maybe, maybe it is somebody like, oh yeah, I heard about that, but I heard about that uh, a lot of those things you hear th about it being unsafe isn't really true, but uh, those, those conversations go very well. But sometimes it can go very south. I'm sure a lot of you have had those conversations with your Uber driver or on the train or, or whatever. I wanted to give you all an example, a, a clip of somebody who has a lot of passion, just like all of you, very passionate person, when it comes to nuclear power, this clip here really shows a lot of good passion, but maybe it's not the most effective way to reach out to people who are maybe a little on the edge when it comes to pro-nuclear, maybe anti-nuclear. Go ahead. We didn't rehearse this, sorry. Oh, do we have sound? I, th I think you all know exactly what he's saying. I think you all know this clip exactly. <laughs> Uh, I can recreate it. Okay, you want to recreate it? <laughs> Let's try one more time. The way it goes is like, you don't really know nuclear, you just have a bad feeling about it, but you don't really know anything about nuclear. All you had heard is some crap from Helen Caldicott. <laughs> that was saying it very nicely. Like, <laughs> I had to cut out some of the cuss words. <laughs> so I'd like to say, this clip um, and this video, including the video on the uh, CO2 emissions uh, causing ocean acidification, that, that had a big impact on me when I was a, a baby nuke, right? 
and I was already in the pro-nuclear camp. This is great for us maybe that are already pro-nuclear, but maybe not exactly a, a good, good example when you're, you're trying to talk to your Uber driver. But. <laughs> okay, so there are a couple of different ways to approach a conversation like this. And just a question to you all, and you don't have to answer it, but when somebody asks you a question about nuclear, what is your first reaction? Uh, if you're like me, the blood pressure rises a little bit. Uh, things get a little tense sometimes. And you might be tempted to respond back to them with facts and information to try to discredit them. This is known as the information deficit model. Essentially, we are providing facts and evidence to counteract their statement and trying to fill in that gap in knowledge that they seem to be displaying. <clears throat> But uh, evidence suggests that this is not very effective. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that. The human brain doesn't operate like a computer. Um, and a lot of times, we become attached to our uh, ideas based on emotion. So simply just getting facts and evidence is not very productive. Think about a time it's happened to you. I mean, it's almost impossible to fact check in real time what people are telling you to. So changing minds requires establishing a base level of empathy and understanding uh, before we start digging into the conversation. You need to know where that person is coming from. And this is known as the engagement model. So with the engagement model, we meet people where they're at, establish shared values, and this helps us lead to a more productive conversation. So facts and evidence there are still important, but let's do a little bit of legwork first. So what does all this mean? How do we engage in the engagement model? Well, this requires a conversation that needs to be handled with care. And the book Crucial Conversations uh, labels these as conversations when the stakes are high, there are opposing opinions, and strong emotions in, involved. <clears throat> so all of us here in the realm of nuclear advocacy are leaders in some way, shape, or form. And as leaders, we're going to be called in to have conversations like this. So we want to learn from this book how we can counter those, or how we can interact in those conversations and have the greatest success. So when crucial conversations pop up, most of us are conditioned to be nice and think that it's hard to be agreeable or honest and respectful at the same time. And so we're forced to choose between two bad options. You can speak up and hurt the relationship of the person you're dealing with, or stay silent and never express the issue to the level that it needs to be talked about. And I. Well, well, this is known as the fool's choice, as referred to in the book. And I want to encourage all of you to reject the fool's choice, because there is another option. And using productive a dialogue to address the issue at hand is what we want to do. Or in the words of Martin Luther King, our lives begin to end the day we become silent on things that matter. So there are three rules to abide by during a conversation. There's actually a lot more, but we tried to skim this down to like the big main takeaways of the book. Um, and they are collaborate around a mutual purpose, ensure safety, and exchange perspectives. So we're going to look at these individually in a bit here. But first, we, before we do that, DJ is going to discuss an actual situation where it has worked. So. Uh, as you all, as I mentioned, I, I had the pragmatic environmentalist page, right? And uh, on that page, on that page, uh, I had uh, a lot of interactions with a lot of people. And one individual that has become a really good friend of mine, uh, some of you might know him, Guido Nunez, amazing individual. Uh, and the way we first met was in disagreement. And it's when I was on my Pragmatic Environmentalist page, I posted this infographic here. I don't know if you can read, yep, perfect. Basically it's saying California spent over $60 billion 
uh, on their uh, trying to reduce their carbon emissions from their electricity. And basically, no success, right? Nothing, nothing to show. Uh, state of Georgia, they're spending less than half of that, and they're about to reduce their carbon emissions by a quarter. Uh, as you all can imagine, posting something like this on Facebook, you're gonna get a lot of kickback, right? And I definitely did. And one of them came from Weedo. This is our first interaction ever. Basically saying, hey, you're wrong. This, this, this says we, California has reduced their emissions. So I think one of our first, uh, I, like Matt was mentioning, uh, we want to respond fist raise. We want to go in there swinging, right? As we mentioned, that's not going to work. What I did, because I had a lot of experience in trying to approach people in a more kind way, but still uh, being strong with the facts, I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, lie to them or be, be uh, dishonest. I approached him like this. I thanked him for bringing that up, and that was sincere. I, I was very appreciative that he was able to give me this resource. And basically, I told him, like, I took a look at your resource. So um, I went through it, and here's the information from that resource. I put pu pulled that graphic out of his resource, and I showed him, look, in-state emissions. Um, from the stuff that's produced actually by California, the stuff they're spending money on, have in fact been flat since the early 2000s. And so this model worked. He thanked me. I thanked him. We, we, we basically uh, created this, this friendship in the comments sections, and I actually uh, messaged him privately, and I invited him to be a part of the Pragmatic Environmentalist. And he actually came in as an editor on my page because I realized like this is the person that I want uh, to be on my page, the person that can go in and do the fact checking. And I'll go into the rest of the story after uh, Matt talks about the rules. Yeah, so we're going to get back to the three main rules of a crucial conversation. First rule is to collaborate around a mutual purpose. So we actually want to convince the other person that we're not in opposition to them, but we're also we're actually on the same side. And to do this, we need to find and express a common purpose, value, or goal. And this can be done just simply by saying what you want from the conversation and what you don't want. So for example, what I want is to exchange perspectives and learn from each other. What I don't want is to cause an argument. Um, so we have to assume that obviously that the person we're working with is both rational and reasonable. Um, and we also, at this point, we want to avoid winning the argument or discrediting the other person because that works against the spirit of collaboration. So when we're able to find and identify a common goal, this chart kind of explains it where this conversation shifts away from that of a monologue in a debate into that of a strategy session. And we can see from what DJ mentioned to Guido by first thanking him and then mentioning that he is diving into the data that he, he sent to him, he is expressing a desire to collaborate. <clears throat> All right, that second rule is to ensure safety. So this is what, what allows the conversation to continue moving forward. And if either party doesn't feel safe in the conversation, um, the, it tends to go towards either silence or violence. So silence meaning that you're finding ways to avoid expressing your true thoughts uh, from, from tactics like masking through sarcasm or sugarcoating, uh, avoiding the topic, or withdrawing from the conversation altogether. Uh, violence, meaning that we are trying to dominate the conversation by controlling what is being said, labeling or attacking the other person. Now, it's really important to make sure you're able to recognize when safety isn't present. And uh, I mean, just use body language if they're not making eye contact or participating in the conversation. Maybe they're raising their voice at you. But if you notice that safety isn't there, you need to reestablish it before you have any hope of the conversation moving forward 
Uh, best way to reestablish is to just mention your common goal again. So as we can see, productive dialogue, which is what we want, happens between the extremes of silence and violence. OK, and that third rule is to make sure you are exchanging perspectives. So this means that it needs to be a two-way dialogue. It can't just be you talking. Um, typically, when crucial conversations pop up, we all tell stories about our, or about the, uh, stories to ourselves about the other person. Um, if it's somebody that's against nuclear, we might be thinking, well, this person obviously is not scientifically literate. Or we might be talking about what John said, this, guy, this person just has a bad feeling about nuclear. They don't really know anything about it. They've just been listening to Helen Caldecott. Um, so in order to have hopes of productive dialogue, we need to assume we don't know anything about that person or how they arrived at their opinion. And we need to invite that other person to share their perspective uh, in order to move that dialogue forward. And you can use a when I invite in, in order to make this happen. So for example, uh, when I hear that you don't support nuclear and you support a heavy wind and solar build out that doesn't include nuclear, I worry that you haven't carefully thought through the d dilemmas such as where are we going to get all the storage or do we have enough land or have you thought about other countries or looked into other countries that have went down this path and what was the result? Maybe I'm not seeing the whole picture. Can you help me understand how you see it? And when you invite somebody to share their perspective, you're not being confrontational. You are simply sharing how you see it from your point of view. And then you can go to work on that collaborative dialogue. So we can sum up the the exchanging ideas into A, B, and C. A, agree where you agree. Uh, it's always good to start with an area of an agreement. B, build on those ideas, uh, or build on those areas of disagreement through sharing information. And then lastly, make sure you're comparing your views. Observe where you've made progress. Have any one of you shifted your opinions? So if we're going to sum up this, these three rules in one graphic, it's right here. Um, in order for a successful conversation to occur, it needs to be a collaborative exchange of ideas. And that needs to take place under the umbrella of safety. When safety is not present, it goes, the conversation goes to silence and violence, and needs to be, safety needs to be reestablished in order for the conversation to continue. So we can see from the final note from Guido, where he thanks him, uh, having, having uh, success with all these rules of conversation, uh, we left on a positive note. And we didn't, you can read what he says, we obviously didn't completely shift his opinion on nuclear simply from this one reaction or interaction, but we gave him a fresh perspective to look at nuclear. So I wanted to mention here, uh, kind of those different places that you can have those conversations. We already mentioned a few of them. On your Uber drive, uh, barbecue with the neighbors, uh, anytime anyone asks you, what, what do you do, right? Uh, and then also online. I wanted to mention on this slide kind of uh, maybe the differences between an online conversation and an in-person conversation. A big, thing, a big thing is a lot of these principles that he was mentioning and I'm about to mention more of, uh, they apply both online and in person. Uh, in per online, the difference is you don't get that nonverbal communication, right? You can't tell by just looking at words on the screen whether or not this person might feel unsafe. Um, sometimes you can. Uh, but a, a big thing is like you're sitting in front of a keyboard, right? They're sitting in front of a keyboard. You're not seeing each other. An important thing to remember is uh, just because you're talking to somebody with words on, on the internet, uh, remember there is a real person on the other side of that keyboard. And they have emotions, they have feelings, and uh, you need to make sure that you're doing all these steps, being collaborative and understanding where they're come from. So 
Another, uh, here's a big thing that I wanted to talk about today. Uh, this is some original content. Uh, we were just talking about something from uh, a book. There's a lot of books out there. If you want to come to me afterwards, I can recommend a lot of different really good ones out there. Um, we, could, we could probably teach a class all day about it. Um, so this is something that I created, and I was actually going to change this. I, I, I put LeClear's here as more of a joke, LeClear's Hill. Uh, and I was telling Matt, I'm like, okay, I want to change it. Like, I want it to be like, I don't know, the Nuclear Advocacy Hill or something. I, he's like, no, nah, man, no, you got to change it. So, or you got to keep it to the Clears Hill. So, it stayed as the Clears Hill, and I even tweeted it uh, not too long ago. But uh, this right here, uh, imagine this is kind of like your energy well, right? Uh, uh, just like we we all deal with uh, when it comes to nuclear and radiation. This is sort of like an energy well thing here. Uh, you have your nuclear activist. Uh, it's really hard to see there. If you want to turn around and look at that one, I'm sorry, it kind of cut off a little bit. Uh, nuclear activist uh, on your far left-hand side all the way to anti-nuclear on the far right-hand side. And a big thing to remember, uh, in order to use our time more efficiently, this, this should help us out. And we want to, instead of trying to get people out of that, that anti-nuclear side and trying to bring them and shove them all the way to the pro-nuclear side, all we need to do is get them to the tipping point. And I drew in a little, this is an extra thing that I added here. Uh, basically, our focus area should be in the green area. Again, trying to use our resources more effectively. Maybe, maybe go into the red area a little bit. Uh, maybe in a future iteration, I'll kind of make it like blend into each other. Um, but in order to, or those people that are deep in that anti-nuclear side, I mean, that's, that's your, your people who I shall not name, Helen Caldecott. Um, maybe you shouldn't be focusing on them, right? So I gave, here's some examples that I gave of, of things that people might say. These aren't perfect examples. It doesn't have everything in here, but uh, here's some things that you might hear people say that are in those certain places on this kind of spectrum. And uh, I wanted to get back to the conversation that I had with my, fr with my friend Guido. And uh, I, I actually asked him before this presentation, do you mind if I, if I use you in my presentation as an example? And he was he was ecstatic about it. It was it was awesome because we're really good friends, and he was he he was really happy about that interaction that we first had and the interactions that we had afterwards. I asked him like I showed him this after asking him if I if I uh, could present about him, and I said, "Where do you think you were on this chart before we met?" I assumed he was already closer to the tipping point. Like I apparently I was wrong. He was actually kind of into that red area. That's why I said, maybe I need to change my, my focus area a little bit on this graph. But he, he was definitely in the thought process of like, mm, like nuclear, maybe it's a little safer than most people say, because he, he was like a, a GMO activist and he knew that people had a lot of misinformation. So it's like, maybe it's a little safer than, but why bother? Like wind and solar and batteries are just gonna take over. So uh, why try going the nuclear route? And uh, through our interaction, that basically uh, nudged him all the way towards that tipping point, or right around the tipping point. Um, in our interactions afterwards, we were on the, on the pragmatic environmentalist, like we made a whole chat and everything, we were talking with each other. I could still tell. Uh, he was definitely very uh, optimistic about solar power. He's like, you know what? Like, You've, you've convinced me that nuclear, nuclear power is going to need to be a big part of the picture here, but eventually, you know, solar is going to take over because it's, it's the renewable energy, right? It's the thing that's going to, uh, <laughs> that, that we need, need to get to, and uh, which puts them right at that tipping point. I didn't come back at him with too much uh, effort, like maybe just slight nudgings. I didn't say, no, you're wrong. Like we need, solar is not the goal. Like that, I did not say that. I was a lot more gentle. I already had him part of the conversation and he was able to collaborate with us and he was able to listen to this information and hear or see the things that we were putting out 
help us fact check him. And he, because of the gravity of the information, it pulled him down that hill. We got him over the tipping point and he just slid right down that hill, just being around the information, just being around people who he knows are, are safe people that are, they, they are here to protect the climate. They, they share the same goal. He just slid right down that hill firmly in the pro-nuclear camp. But I would say he wasn't necessarily back up that other hill, which is a nice thing to have. Not necess necessarily my uh, specific goal when I'm trying to bring more people from the uh, anti-nuclear side over to the pro-nuclear side. Um, but it takes, it takes, again, more effort to get you into the nuclear ac activist side of things. It took effort on me. It took effort of realizing that climate change was a big deal for me to finally step in in, in, in 2017. For Guido, the big thing for him is when the skies over California turned a dark orange color. He went out onto, uh, this is actually pictures that he took on the uh, top of his apartment. He went up there and took pictures and he actually did a Facebook Live on the Pragmatic Environmentalist because he got really passionate and realized like, shoot, like I need to be an activist now. I need to be saving nuclear plants. Th the fact that we're shutting down Diablo Canyon is stupid. So he, as, as some of you know, became, became part of the Save Diablo Canyon camp. And this picture um, of him here uh, on the left-hand side is of him at the Capitol in Sacramento. He was there into the wee hours of the morning, I think it was 1.30 in the morning, when the legislator of California voted to save the Diablo Canyon nuclear plant. He was there all the way until they pushed that forward and we won. Five years, but we'll, we'll think about it that more in the future, but big deal. So some final takeaways from kind of both our presentations, um, as well as from that uh, tool that I gave you all, is remember, uh, it's about nudging people over to our side. Uh, do it with kindness. Kill people with kindness, right? It doesn't mean that you, you don't need to be passionate. That's, that's super important to have that passion. And it doesn't mean that you need to be leaving out information. But you need to uh, basically uh, realize that this is a collaboration and understand where that person is coming from. It's not about winning. Also, remember, that person that you're talking to, maybe they're bringing up some points. They might be that next person to save the next nuclear plant. Thank you. Quite often when I'm active, uh, actively addressing anti-nuclear comments in uh, comment section or in social media pages. I'm quite often mentally, I'm addressing not the person directly, but I'm actually just trying to get um, all the other observers of that conversation, trying to get the point across to them. So I guess the question I have for you is, um, do these rules still apply if that is your objective? I am so glad you asked that question because I was thinking about when I was rehearsing this, I was like, oh man, I left out this. And thank you for bringing that up because that's been a common thing that uh, we, we, we uh, have talked about how we're here not necessarily to change that person's mind that you're commenting to. Maybe that person is like deep into that anti-nuclear thing that maybe, maybe you shouldn't be wasting your time on trying to bring them over, right? I think a lot of people think that that gives them liberty to just like bash on that person right and to not think about this person as a real person but like you said we're trying to uh, affect those other people that are watching this conversation and if you can uh, address that person like they're a real person it's it's like you're addressing those other people watching as well they see it I have seen people 
that have seen me in the trenches with people that are just like eventually I had to block them that would message me privately and they're like, hey, like, thank you for what you're doing. Like, I don't necessarily agree with everything you're saying, um, but what you're, you're, you're doing it in a very, very uh, appropriate way. So yes, I would say uh, go, using the principles that we're talking about is super important, even for those people that you might not be necessarily trying to bring over onto our side. Well, thank you. My name is Bryant. Um, and I was wondering if you happen to be talking with someone and they know all of these same things, they do this style of communication, and they ask you a technical question, and it's, hey, I know that you are um, really into nuclear, but I'm concerned that you haven't really thought about what would happen if a plant were to explode next year, you know, some, something, right? The, one of the usual fare. And so how would you, how do you respond? Um, I guess, A, how do you communicate with people who are in the same sort of realm? And then also, what do you do if you, um, if that question they ask you, I guess just about that, but then what also if you don't know the answer to it, what do you sort of do in those situations? It's kind of two things there. Like when you don't know the answer, it's, it's always okay to be like, uh, I don't know is, is an okay thing to say and like I can get back to you type of things. Uh, and what's interesting I, I, it, that you brought that up, I have seen that many times of people that I'm like, oh, oh, I see they're using those levers of influence on me. Like I see what they're doing there. Uh, but if they are a truly honest person that's, that's trying to use those levers of influence in, the, in a, uh, a way that they feel is, is uh, uh, an appropriate way, like they, they think, okay, like I'm right, like, and I'm gonna, they, they should know that they wanna collaborate with me, right? And maybe it is gonna be a little difficult to kind of bring them onto your side, but I, f I think you could, you could easily find more common ground with those specific types of people. Um, I, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question, but I think finding that common ground might be really easy. Uh, I'll add that. Yeah. So when, when they use the same thing we just talked about to you, that's a good thing because they are, they, if they say, well, have you thought about the disasters? Well, that's a perfect invitation for you to actually have a conversation about it. Uh, and they're basically inviting you because they want to know. They're not being aggressive towards you. And I'll also say on the, I don't know the answer to that. It is totally okay to say you don't know the answer to that and try to find out later. I, haven't, I don't come from a nuclear energy background and having been with Generation Atomic for just over a year, there's still a lot I don't know about nuclear, but I'm always okay to express that, you know, when we're in a, an, an engagement that is uh, amicable. Time for one more. Alrighty. Okay, who, who was first? Be honest. All right. <laughs> Hi, I'm Grant Mills. Uh, I engage with a lot of people who aren't necessarily anti-nuclear, but are sort of on the fence. They, they I guess, sit in the, the plateau area of your graph. Do you have any techniques for uh, making them feel safe enough to share some of their misgivings instead of standing idly by while you do all the talking? Yes, and I, again, another, we could talk about this all day long, and that's one of the things I kind of left out of my uh, of the presentation of some of the techniques you can use for those people that are on the edge, uh, usually more willing to, to, to listen. Uh, one of the things that's important is if you decide to like go extreme to the pro-nuclear side of things, uh, our, our natural reaction, uh, our people's natural reaction is to see balance, right? They want to see balance to an argument. So if you come at them, um, from a purely pro-nuclear argument, a very strong one, they want to see that balance, they will tend to gravitate over to represent the anti-nuclear argument. So it's important that uh, you're taking a step towards them and almost like you're representing, you, you could, uh, in your communication, help represent that anti-nuclear side of things. Like, I, uh, an example is when people are like, well, like, I heard wind and solar like are really cheap, aren't they? Like, isn't nuclear really expensive? Like, you could be like, yeah, like wind and solar uh, over the last, oh, over a decade uh, has made extreme progress when it comes to reducing their costs. 
but we're often focused on you know levelized cost of emissions and uh, it, it doesn't show you the whole picture and uh, so you can you want to represent that other side as well when they might be more in the neutral side of things does that make sense yeah thank you okay I think I think we're done thank you everyone thank you, my hand. Everybody's heard of the term straw man argument, right? So there's the, the antonym of that is steel manning the argument. And it's a really good way to build credibility with someone you're talking to and, and, and let them know you, you've fully researched the issue. You're not just speaking from an isolated, extremely biased position.